New Mexico has one of the highest unemployment rates in the nation at 6.2 percent, and finding a job is even harder in rural areas like the Navajo Nation. Now, one way to make a living is to start your own business, but that also comes with the unique challenges on the reservation that entrepreneurs don't face in other communities. Producer Sarah Gustavus recently visited the Navajo Nation to look at the issue for the State of Change project with the Solutions Journalism Network and other media partners across the state. And she'll sit down afterwards with the project coordinator to talk more about the focus of the series, Resilience in Rural New Mexico. On the western edge of the Navajo Nation, the North Loop family farm is wrapping up the growing season. We're putting the farm to bed for the winter time and then starting up new crops in the greenhouse. Um, right about now it's when the farmers, they'll go home, you know, tend to their uh, livestock, families, but they'll be back in the springtime again. <laughs> Stacy Jensen grew up in the area, but went away to school. He came back later and helped start this farm that provides space for about 30 families to grow produce. It's an important resource because fresh produce is hard to find in local stores. But there is a tradition of farming in the area that some want to preserve or bring back. Elders like Betty Kelly learn to farm from a young age. And she says Navajo people once relied on small-scale farming to feed themselves. North Loop Family Farm supports subsistence farming to feed individuals and families, but the nonprofit is also looking for ways to grow operations and hire more local people. That means finding ways to sell produce and other food products, and that's where they turn to the Native American Business Incubator Network. Whenever we see somebody who has a skill that they're trying to market to um, either their community or even outside their community, we want to help them turn that skill into something that they can re rely on for um, financial gain. But aspiring entrepreneurs who live on the Navajo Nation and Native Americans who live on reservations and pueblos across New Mexico face unique challenges when starting a business. First, you can't just walk into a bank and offer your house as collateral for a business loan. That's a very simple bank transaction off the reservation. Well, on the reservation, uh, you might own your home, but you don't own the land there. Stego says there are multiple potential solutions, from crowdfunding to get a project off the ground, to crafting new tribal <laughs> regulations to make it easier for members to access land and capital. We want to foster economic development on the reservation within tribal communities. And when we say that, we're talking the whole gamut of entrepreneurs. So um, we want to include everybody from the person who makes clothes or jewelry or crafts or sells burritos to the larger scale businesses who are able to employ uh, several employees. Nabin helped the North Loop Family Farm find matching funds for a federal grant. But there are challenges that can only be addressed by the tribal government. In Window Rock, Navajo Nation officials are also talking about entrepreneurship. President Russell Begay says his administration is proud of an agreement the tribe signed with the federal government this year to take over control of leasing on their lands. Anytime BIA, Bureau of Indian Affairs, had to put their name on it, and they did. Every lease, whether it's business or otherwise, they had to put their name on it. But the minute they have their name on it, then federal regulation kicks in. And we had to, anyone that's uh, starting business had to conform to these federal regulations, which is extensive. But now, they don't have to. And BIA is out of the game. We're completely in control of our land. And so we follow our regulations. Along with streamlining the regulatory process, President Begay says the Navajo Nation set aside $20 million in funding to support entrepreneurs who've been shut out of the traditional lending process. 
Begay says he believes new opportunities for entrepreneurs and small businesses will give young people the chance to stay and build a career on the reservation and encourage those who left for school or jobs to return. Navajos are excited about coming home, and we didn't have that before. And the reason why they left is because it was more exciting to be out there than here. But now it's, that's being reversed. Back at the North Loop family farm, Stacy Jensen is looking for ways to expand the business side of the farm. He built a greenhouse to grow crops in the winter and started a small market on the property. Families from the North Loop farm can sell extra produce from their plots or to yeah, Jensen for the market. And he thinks there's a unique potential in identifying a specialty product that could be targeted for commercial sales. I think that's going to be our blue corn. Um, we'll, we'll process it, we'll do cornmeal, we'll make some uh, value-added products. Um, corn chips, blue corn chips is one of them. According to a survey by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, in 2012, there were nearly 15,000 farms on the Navajo Nation. The majority produced $1,000 or less in products annually. And there's another test for the resilience of the agriculture system. The average age of farmers on the Navajo Nation was 58. Aging farmers is a concern nationwide. Jensen works with local schools, and he sees potential in intergenerational farming. I think we, we bring the, both the elders and the youth, and we try to re-engage them um, through educational, uh, through projects, through work, um, through workshops. Um, the kids, you know, they know something. Elders know something, so they exchange those ideas there. And, um, and, and, it, and it helps out. I think it, it'll, in the long run, I think it will bring the youth back to the farm. For New Mexico in Focus and State of Change, I'm Sarah Gustavus. Leah Todd is with me now. Leah is the Mountain States coordinator and a reporter for the Solutions Journalism Network. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. This project, State of Change, includes partners across New Mexico. What are some other stories that have been covered for this series, including your own? Well, every newsroom took a slightly different approach, which I think is one of the big strengths of a collaboration like this. So first off, for example, Stacy Matlock, the editor and a reporter for the Taos News, is taking this really unique longitudinal look at the nearby community of Raton. So she is in year two of what she hopes becomes a five-year project, following this town's um, evolution away from coal and toward something else, ideally. So that's one approach that Stacy and the Taos News took for this project. Um, another approach, another story was from NewMexicoPolitics.net. Heath Hauseman is the editor and publisher there. And he decided to take a sort of snapshot in time, deep dive look into a single community of truth or consequences, New Mexico, 6,000 people just south of Albuquerque. And he wanted to look at the way that a single pair of entrepreneurs was spreading this sort of shockwave of economic development through the community. So he has this in-depth, also very close and on the, on the ground with one community um, look, but the story is, is focused on a single point in time. Um, some of the other examples include Antonia Gonzalez, who you've worked with before with Kiwanak Broadcasting and National Native News, took a look at a single program less about a single community per se, and more about a single program that had a really long track record of working with the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. She looked at how well that program worked, what its outcomes had been over time, which was a big asset for that story. Um, another I hope that there's some lessons here in New Mexico that we can learn from Pine Ridge. Absolutely, right. So one of the ideas of this entire project is to focus in really clearly on what's the transferable insight or what could this seemingly disparate community several states away have to teach our own communities here in New Mexico about economic development or about community resilience or about growth in, in rural places? And what about your story on the Young West? So one of the projects that I took on was actually a data visualization. I worked with Headwaters Economics up in Bozeman, Montana to analyze migration data over the past several decades. And it, all of it was trying to answer this question of where is the Young West? We hear all about the rural brain drain. New Mexico PBS did the excellent series recently about rural places that are just losing our young people. And we don't hear often about these sort of positive deviants or the places that are breaking that trend. And so I wanted to find out what are the rural communities across the entire West, all of the 11 Western states, 
where young people are actually moving in with families or maybe just young people in their 20s. So Headwaters broke down migration data over the past 30 years to highlight communities that were losing young people and communities that were actually managing to attract young people. So that's an online data visualization. People can interact with that. Um, it's super in-depth and, and new. You know, it's a, an original sort of question that this project answered. And the umbrella idea was resilience right. in rural communities. Uh, why focus on that for this series? Well, one answer to that, I think, is that in rural communities, for those of us who live in small towns, and I'm, I live up in Taos, um, we know the hardships that our communities face. We live them day in and day out, let alone see them on TV or read about them in the local newspaper. And I think what is less well understood is what is being tried against some aspect of these many problems that are really well understood. We just don't know in many cases what other towns like us, our size or our demographic, are trying. And so that's a big effort of this project is to try and ask what are other communities doing and what could other communities learn um, when it comes to this question of economic viability for small towns. What are the jobs that will be in Taos, New Mexico or Truth of Consequences or Mora in the next generation? What will it look like? What are some common ideas or issues that came up in the series? Lots of common issues. I think the main one is this question of what jobs will my grandchildren have? if they want to stay in this community. That's a question that I heard over and over in my own reporting. And I think when you get down to it, that's really a baseline question for a lot of these stories that come out of the State of Change package. So in terms of the common issues, this brain drain, this loss of our um, bright young people into cities and urban places is a big shared issue. Um, in terms of shared themes or shared fixes, there were some surprising um, themes that came up. One of them was microbreweries that are popping up across the state. And this is not just unique to New Mexico. Lots of other rural places in the Mountain West are experiencing this right now. Um, the, the role that microbreweries can play, not only in creating jobs and elevating a tourist community sort of to the next level, but also in creating community gathering spaces, places where the community can get together and create sort of a life of its own. Um, there was a story from Carlsbad and New Mexico politics story from Truth or Consequences, both focused on breweries as a potential fix. Um, another theme that came up in my reporting is the interest in some rural communities where the natural resources are right to create a sort of outdoor economy, an outdoor lifestyle. So Cuesta, for example, um, the former mayor there was explaining to me that he is interested in seeing the fishing and outdoor recreation industry coming to Cuesta, where a couple of years ago, the traditional employer, the Chevron mine, um, closed down. So laid off several hundred people, and this community is really wrestling with what's next. One answer could be bringing in a robust system of um, fishing and hunting guides like what is going on right now in Mora. So across these different communities, there's the same fix that's, that's being attempted, at least, with, with varying degrees of success, I would say. And what's next for the project? Importantly, more stories are coming out next week and the week after, so keep an eye out for those. But there's also this critical next step for us as journalists to really hear from the people who are impacted by these problems and hear from people who have any say in changing the situation, who have any sway over any part of these problems that um, this, this project dug up. So we need to hear from the audience. Um, and I know KNME has a couple ideas about how to do that. We are going to be listening to audience and viewer and reader reaction over the coming weeks and months and figuring out a way to get the right people paying attention to this reporting and telling us what else we should be looking into and what promising responses are happening in various rural communities that we haven't found yet. So more reporting to come. We can certainly connect people to the project at NewMexicoInFocus.org. Leah Todd, thanks for stopping by. Thanks, Sarah.